Welcome to Chain Tech, the show and podcast focusing on the latest trends in supply chain, procurement, and logistic technology. My name is Max Henry from the Global Supply Chain Council, and together with my co-host and special guest, we explore the personalities, startups, innovators, and industry players driving disruption in supply chain. From early stage to unicorns, and from cutting-edge technology to the people using it to help drive more innovative, agile, and resilient supply chain around the world. This is Chantech. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Chain Tech. I'm your host, Max Henry, from the Global Supply Chain Council. So thanks again for joining us for another episode of the show as we continue to host some of the most interesting Chain Tech founders and discuss the rapid rise of supply chain logistics and procurement technology across Asia. As we jump into today's conversation, also, I want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, we still have our Chain Tech platform that you can uh, have a look and check it out. Uh, where we bring a number of new solutions on a regular basis. And also, if you're interested to listen to the previous interviews, uh, you can uh, go and visit chaintech.show. So today I'm very happy to uh, to host uh, uh, one of our founders uh, called Jan Schwemans, who is the founder and CEO of Basket. Hi, Jan. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me here. Okay, so let me jump into uh, right into our, our question, and we always start by trying to understand a little bit your, on your background. If you could share a little bit on, you know, uh, where you come from, what you've done in the past, and maybe starting with your field of studies, and um, and maybe talk briefly about some of the uh, maybe corporate job that you had before uh, before starting Basket. Yeah. Sure. Um, let me start this uh, at the family origins, right? Uh, because it connects to to what I'm doing today. So uh, I come from a, a legacy of about 400 years or so of manufacturing and distribution, right? both on the Belgian and on the Brazilian side. On the Belgian side, which is one of my nationalities, we were brewers. We brewed beer for a very long period of time, just something that you do in Belgium, right? Um, uh, that lasted up to around the ni- 1950s. Um, and then from there, once the brewery was shut down, my family moved to Brazil and started to make orange juice. So uh, a very manufacturing, distribution-heavy background on the family. Um, and uh, I guess that that kind of laid the foundation for what I would do with my own career, with my own life. Uh, even though I did spend quite a bit of time between the two countries, um, ever since I was in my teen years, you know, uh, I was always fantasizing about working in the space as well, in, in consumer goods, in distribution, supply chain. So the first opportunity that I had after finishing my studies in economics in, in the UK uh, I jumped straight back into it. And, uh, I went to work for one of the largest uh, brewers, uh, so a company called AB InBev. And uh, that threw me into a global career in supply chain, where I spent a lot of time in APAC, uh, countries like China, uh, doing a lot of work in India, Southeast Asia, covering many areas from uh, digital supply chain management to M&A and even managing some of the markets for them. So I guess it's a, it's a long consumer goods uh, dynasty there. Uh, with the past 10 years or so, spending quite a lot of time in APAC, um, especially in the space of uh, beverages and FMCG. So what was the that haha moment and what actually triggered you to to start your own company? Uh, about 2017, a year or a year and a half after the company sent me to China, I was giving a project to uh, help them to digitize parts of their supply chain, especially around the intermediaries that they work with. Um, and back then, there was this feeling in the company of all oh, these, uh, our third party uh, wholesalers and distributors, they're so complicated. It's a black box. It's us versus them. And, you know, the company said, hey, Jan, go try to help us figure this out. You know, how can we squeeze them? How can we get the most out of it? Uh, and so I went there with that mentality of, you know, it's me versus them. It, we're going to have this conversation where I ha- almost have to find ways to figure out where they're taking advantage of the company or how I can find leverage. But as I went to talk to these wholesalers and these distributors, this whole world opened up to me across all of China. And this was without, without, uh, uh, without exception. 
I just got to realize how important those intermediaries were to the local communities, to the actual health of those supply chains. And that, sure, you know, they're smart and they're playing games with the brand principles, but they're so fundamental. Nothing happens unless we have the right incentive of align, uh, uh, alignment of incentives and also the right connectivity and data exchange. So that flipped my worldview of, hey, these intermediaries are so, so, so important. How can we get brands? How can we get the supply chain to operate in a little bit more harmony so we maximize that relationship between the upstream and the downstream? So ever since then, I've been obsessed with creating vertical software that helps that relationship, that helps the exchange of data, that helps the flows between those principles and those intermediaries. It took me a while to uh, act on it, I had to mature in my career for a few years before I did it. So I spent another four or five years in the company before pulling the trigger. But that was the moment where I became obsessed with helping supply chain intermediaries be better and receive better treatment from the manufacturers. So in one sentence, what is Basket doing? So Basket is an enabler for supply chain middlemen. We believe that especially in emerging markets, the middle parts of the supply chain cannot be removed. They need to be empowered. And to empower it, we need three elements, credit, uh, software, and commercial support. So we provide those three things to uh, supply chain intermediaries for the benefit of the downstream and also the manufacturers. So who are your customers and what are the biggest benefits that your solution is bringing to them? Our customers are predominantly distributors and wholesalers that serve the general trade. So these are the more traditional parts of the supply chain. So these customers, they're not small. They're actually relatively large in terms of turnover. Some of them do millions a month in turnover. But because they service traditional parts of the supply chain, both in consumer goods and things like textile and garments, they themselves are not very digitized. They still use pen and paper. They don't have core systems. A lot of times they don't have access to formal financing. So the core benefit that we bring to them is we remove some of the back end, some of the operational heaviness from their business, save them some uh, costs, enhance their ability to reach new customers digitally, but protect what they do best, which is the front office. They are amazing uh, at engaging their local communities. And we don't want to mess with that. We want to remove the operational heaviness from their hand so they can do what they do best, the best they can. So what kind of tools do you actually provide to them? Can you just take a few examples of some of your most interesting tools or feature that uh, those dis distributors can use? Yeah. yeah, so the the customer touch points between our wholesalers and their customers are often manual self-pickup, cash and carry, WhatsApp communications. There's very little active engagement. Uh, it's a very passive relationship. Uh, what we do on the front office for them is we enable them to manage through a CRM, through an order management portal, to manage a lot of those conversations and a lot of those interactions digitally so they can drive more business from their existing customers, but more easily get their product catalog with dynamic pricing, with promotions that they might want to run to more customers. So that's on the front office, increasing revenue. Now to do that, I need a very strong back office. So I need a very strong inventory management uh, software, a very strong uh, uh, warehouse management software so that I know in that messy warehouse what's available, what they need more of. So I can also help them on the procurement side. So I help them on both sides with a, a series of back, back office and front office platforms. So on the supply side, they're dealing with... Uh manufacturers, large, very large manufacturers, right, uh, who are providing bulk, uh, you know, orders to them for certain type of products. And then on the other side, they're facing retailers, mom and pop, uh, you know, supermarkets, you know, convenience stores, right? Is is That's this right. where they stand? Yeah, okay. So you mentioned that uh, a lot of us uh, distributors can be somehow medium, medium or large companies are still, uh, you know, uh, quite a laid back in terms of technology. So are they, you know, what kind of tools are they currently using? Like, uh, you know, are they using like Excel or, or you, you mentioned WhatsApp, you know, so what are they running on right now and, and how do you help them to, uh, you know, change the way that they, you know, uh, adopt technology? Some of them are using tools imposed by the brand principles, by the manufacturers. So they will use extensions of their ERPs or they will use, they will use internal B2B platforms. But those are usually uh, adopted only to a certain extent um, because obviously they're only servicing the requirements of one principle. It's not the distributors or the wholesaler's choice to use. So in, in that case, what we do is 
we actually say, I know that you need to please your brand principal. Let me give you the tools that will actually help you manage the other parts of the business uh, in a way that, that works for you. So for the ones that are using things, we help to manage that relationship. So we, we make their multi-platform engagement with the brand principles a lot more manageable for them. So they don't have to open 20, 30 different apps at once. Right. So that's on the more sophisticated distributor side. On the less sophisticated side, oftentimes they're using Excel at best, at best or, or some very old POS that they also kind of use as an inventory management tool. But that's on the, on the best case scenario. In a lot of cases, they are, you know, either using their, their, their brain to, to keep track mm-hmm. of inventory or they're using pen and paper, maybe a very, very simple spreadsheet. So it's very, very rudimentary. There's not, not a, the sense of urgency around keeping the warehouse up to date. It's not the, the thing that is most top of mind. So you're currently based in Jakarta. So you're obviously focusing on the Indonesian market, which is a huge FMCG, uh, you know, market for, for a lot of brands. Why did you pick uh, Indonesia and not, uh, you know, I mean, you, you went China before, which is much more mature. Uh, but why did you pick Indonesia and not the other Asian countries here? Yeah? So I've been obsessed with uh, finding a way to create uh, vertical solutions for many, many years, you know, almost seven years now. Um, and with that obsession comes the desire to tackle the biggest problem out there. Uh, and if I look in terms of complexity, fragmentation, um, and also uh, the the current timing of the market, Indonesia is just at the perfect inflection point. It is so fragmented. The topography, the demographics, they're all at that you know, perfect point around digital adoption, but also with a very traditional supply chain. So I, I like to think of Indonesia as the nirvana for that that obsession that I had, right? Just because it ticks all of those boxes. Now, there is a separate component to this as well. Indonesia received a lot of funding for digital initiatives, startups, and supply chain in different areas. But the specific area that I'm interested in around wholesalers and intermediaries, that has been very underfunded. So I felt that the piece of the puzzle I can contribute can really be meaningful here. The entire industry is also going through major change. Obviously, there's been a, you know, some pretty big marketplace, uh, you know, e-commerce marketplace in Indonesia, uh, the like of Tokopedia and Shopee and Lazada. You know, how are you, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, helping those world sellers and distributors to connect and work more efficiently with those uh, e-marketplace? Yeah. That is a, it's a really good question because it's at the, at the center of why we do what we do. Um, the premise that basket stands behind is that e-commerce in its own cannot reach its full potential unless the underlying infrastructure is ready to provide the fulfillment, the entire logistics, the warehousing, etc. That's why e-commerce usually stops at 8, 10, 12% penetration, even in developed markets. So what we're doing with our wholesalers is digitizing them so they can be part of that online to offline infrastructure. So a lot of times what ends up happening is our wholesalers, sure, they want to buy from brands. They want to have that formal relationship, but they're predominantly focused on sourcing, on having access to the best possible portfolio. And sometimes that comes from e-commerce platforms. Sometimes that comes from different types of sources. So having that connectivity and making it seamless for our wholesalers is a very important step in bringing the right price and the right assortment to the different communities. Because the wholesalers at the end of the day, they're kind of like a, a payment gateway and a fulfillment center for that for that uh, community. Now, naturally, what we do very simplistically on the downstream side between the wholesaler and their customers is digitizing that order making. And for from in the spectrum of uh, journeys, right, it's a very important educational point to moving uh, consumers and retailers into a more e-commerce driven type of order making. But those wholesalers are also being disrupted by by those marketplace, right? A number of them. Uh, you know, are competing with those huge marketplaces in Indonesia. So how do you see them evolving and is technology becoming one of the key advantage or, you know, one of the edge that they have to, uh, to leverage if they want to stay competitive in this market? I believe the, and this is something you can see through the data, uh, e-commerce uh, penetration or percentage of total sales went through the roof during COVID. And there was this expectation that uh, it was going to stay that way. But immediately after COVID, the traditional channels, the offline channels, mom and pop shops and whatnot, actually bounced back stronger than pre-COVID, which was completely against what everybody expected. So what does this tell you? This tells you that there is still a requirement. There's still a trust component in shopping locally. 
There is still a huge need and a huge legacy in the supply chains run by brand principles, which depends on these wholesalers. And third, uh, there are situations in which, you know, it's uh, it aligns everybody's interest to have hundreds of thousands of these wholesalers using their own working capital to stock up and hold inventory. Removing that might not be as healthy for the brand principles as people think. So my perspective is that for the next 30, 40, 50 years, we're actually going to see a very small decline in the overall contribution to the market. Sure, there will be some consolidation, but it will not be as drastic as people think. It will be more of a modernization rather than a removal. Um, If you think about, if you take that, uh, a step forward um, as well. Um, when you think about uh, markets like Philippines and Brazil, interestingly, uh, a lot of wholesalers and a lot of wholesaler groups developed into cash and carries and developed into these large developed groups where the wholesaler and the distributor's role is morphed into this kind of like hybrid large DC with a Costco-like uh, front. Um, I foresee that more and more we'll see some of those dynamics playing in Indonesia as well. So they will be strengthened, I believe, at least, but modernized. For your solutions, do you have any competition in a, in a country like Indonesia? Uh, we, because we're building vertically, we compete in different fronts, right? So we take many battles. Um, I would say that the wholesaler, the middleman and power men narrative is a new one. So folks who are going directly for wholesalers, going directly for Let's help them out from a technology central point of view. Uh, that's quite new. So I don't see that many people out there. But because uh, we also use our wholesalers, we have more than 150 today. And then we bring those wholesalers as a solution to brand principles to improve their supply chains. There are other companies that provide supply chain services here. Right? So in, in some cases, we, we would have some, some competition there, especially uh, startups that have started to brand themselves as digital distributors. Uh, so yeah, we, we pick some fights with different, different folks, but centrally at the wholesaler, I think it's quite a new initiative. Do you focus on specific segments, uh, in terms of product category or do you go across the entire FMCG or, or general trade, uh, segment? We built for FMCG first. Okay. The mindset that FMCG has the broadest infrastructure because it's such a large supply chain. And then what ended up happening is from FMCG, we started to branch out into textiles, into things that are more kind of beauty and personal care, uh, things that are a little bit on the fringes, not as fast moving with higher margins using the infrastructure from FMCG. So I would say today we're 60% or so FMCG and then multi-category across a variety of things. Okay. How do you market your solutions and get your customers? So, you know, obviously those companies, will sell distributors and you calling them? Do you, you know, meet them at, at shows? How does that work? How do you get your business here? Yeah. A very local, very regional business. Yeah. So we have to hire and we have to work with people who know that community very well. So uh, our motto is, you know, very deep, you know, build community-based strongholds. So whenever we go into a community, the people that we hire there, they will know the wholesalers, they will know the distributors. And then we go very deep into those communities. And then we expand bit by bit outside using the networks that we already know. So it's almost like going in circles around a central point. That enables us to have minimal spend on marketing and use things like referrals, use things like additional hires who have those connections already in order to bring business. Now, what we're starting to do today is we're starting to work with very large brand principles in Indonesia who say, hey, I love what you're doing in terms of bringing us new wholesalers. I would love for you to plug into my existing supply chain where I have also thousands of wholesalers. And can you help me to make sense of that? So there is a a more kind of efficient go-to-market now where the distributors and the big principals are pushing us using their existing verticals. So Indonesia obviously is a very fragmented market with, you know, both industry-wise, but also uh, geographically. Uh, those distributors and world sellers, you know, I mean, you know, really different from different province and different islands. And, and within those islands, you also have different regency. And so, how do, you know, are those companies very, very local and very, you know, regional, regional focus? Very. Uh I was just having this conversation the other day with uh, uh, the CEO of a company that operates in central Java uh, and a bit different, but we, we have exposure to the same types of clients um, that we were just talking about just how different the profile is. So in West Java, which is where we're very strong, 
uh, the wholesalers are more like warehouses. So it's 80% warehouse, 20% retail front uh, with a little bit of a cash and carry. In Central Java, it's very cash and carry focused and very trading focused with the warehouse kind of deprioritized and a lot more sparsely uh, populated. So, so for sure, the differences are massive, even within Java. So it's very difficult to generalize. What is your revenue model uh, with those uh, distributors? And how do you make money with those companies? As a company, we build vertical software, right? Meaning that uh, we want to provide an operating system end-to-end, principal all the way down to retail. But we realize that given our age, we're just a year, year and a half old now, uh, we cannot do all of that and be a profitable company because we'll be spreading ourselves too thin. And it's very difficult to sell in technology as a pure solution in Southeast Asia. So what we do is we anchor components of a marketplace as our Trojan horse into that relationship. So the first thing that we drive for our customers is incremental revenue. So we onboard wholesalers who in our marketplace can be both sellers and buyers. And then we find ways to bring them additional volume, additional orders. And we monetize that. Once we've monetized that and we're making him money as well, so on a revenue share basis, we have then earned trust. Once we've earned a trust, he is okay to begin paying us a fee, a platform fee, a subscription for the platform that we provide him. Now, we do this over and over and over and over again to hundreds of wholesalers. And then we bring those wholesalers to the big uh, brand principles. And then we have strategic partnerships, kind of more outcomes-based partnerships with the brand principles who want to improve their market share to who want to improve their specific supply chains. And that's really the big uh, generator of revenue for us. Okay. Tell us about your team. How many employees do you have full-time and how many engineers? And do you actually develop everything in Indonesia or do you also some of the uh, solution development uh, to other countries? So we are about 50 people today. Uh, 50 people full-time with uh, a few uh, sales agents in the field, but that's the core team. Uh, about half of that is product and uh, tech. The remainder will be about 20 to 25 product and tech. About 20 is on the operational and commercial side, partnerships, but also managing our, our day-to-day. And then we we are six leaders. Uh, the team is very Indonesian focused. Uh, I'm, I'm the only non-Indonesian from that, that perspective. Uh, so I needed to compensate. Um, but they are all a pretty diverse set of, uh, of folks. So we have uh, veterans who were part of some of the first generation platforms that uh, tried to crack the supply chains in Indonesia. So we're taking some of those learnings. We have uh, folks who have been in supply chains for 20, 30 years across from verticals on the commercial side. So we're, we're a little bit of a melting pot of new digital blood trying a second time. And then also veterans who've been more on the traditional side and bring more of that general trade wisdom. Um, we've chose, chosen to do everything here locally and built a truly local Indonesian company because we realized that it's already such a diverse country with so many uh, ethnicities, sub-ethnicities, so many ways of working, so much complexity. We need people to be firmly plugged in on the ground, which is why myself as well, I spend a lot of time in the field. I go to visit the market a lot. And even though my Bahasa is not perfect, you know, I get by and I make it a point to be there as much as I can. Let's talk about your founding uh, journey. Uh, if you could share a little bit of how you, you know, started the company. Did you uh, bootstrap it for, for some time? And what was um, the type of, you know, founding that you raised in the past few years? Yeah. For us, getting started was not easy because we came at a time when companies in Indonesia had raised a lot of money, a lot of money. And they they had models that were almost the polar opposite of what we were trying to do from, uh, you know, from either a disruptor or enabler, right? So for us to come into the market, a foreign founder, starting something new, and then knocking on the doors of VCs, they were like, wait, wait a second, we just funded, you know, this company and that company. So, so for me, I had to resort to going into my inner circle and speaking to mentors, speaking to people that have deep trust in me and have worked with me for and long enough to know that I, I'm able to execute. So I got together a few CEOs of certain companies. So uh, Kraft Heinz, APAC CEO, uh, ABM Bev CEO, uh, Heineken, former CEO for certain certain markets, uh, several of these FMCG folks who, you know, uh, had had that trust. And we got together a nice little group and that got me off the ground. And that got me through that initial period of, uh, investors weren't too comfortable with us because we were new 
And then also, you know, we, we just needed to, to be able to get some momentum. Um, what was interesting for us is that we were able to get, uh, uh, traction very quickly. So the moment that we hit revenue and a few months from, from starting the company, that changed the perspective, the perspective of investors. So around the beginning of, uh, 2023, when we were revamping up our investor engagement, uh, we had our pre-seed round, uh, which was led by an investor called Forge Ventures. And, um, that was for us, you know, the first, oh, wow. Okay. Now we're funded. Now we're, we're safe. Uh, what we hadn't realized is that the market, uh, narrative had been changing a lot from disruptor to enabler. So the moment that we closed our pre-seed round, we immediately reopened a seed round and raised another round. So there were two back to back rounds at the beginning of 2023, which have afforded us the luxury of having four or five years of runway today. So in total, we raised about five and a half million dollars. Uh, and our burn is minimal. So, you know, I think we we are in a pretty comfortable position today to be able to, uh, experiment and drive things. Let's talk about the, uh, the pandemic. And so what kind of lesson have you learned and, and how challenging it was for you to go for, you know, that difficult time, uh, in a place like Indonesia? Yeah. And in the, in the early days, you mean when we were starting out? Yeah, probably yeah, starting out and then at the end of it also. And, and probably what other lessons you learn, uh, out of that pandemic? Yeah. As uh, you as an entrepreneur. So uh, the pandemic has fundamentally changed a lot of dynamics within the supply chain here. Um, some of the things I mentioned were stronger than before the pandemic. So where's the general trade penetration, which took a lot of people by surprise because people had been investing in digital commerce. And so nobody could have predicted that. Um, it also changed dynamics around when the loadings and when the supply cycles, the inventory uh, ups and downs happen within the country in a way that is probably more permanent than people expected as well. So uh, as the first uh, Lebaran, the first kind of Ramadan Lebaran period, which is when a lot of loading happens in uh, in Indonesia ahead of the festive period, that is, you know, a very, very important uh, time for uh, supply chain companies. I was entering the market right as the loading was uh, beginning to happen and people were making preparations. So uh, what we were expecting is we were expecting uh, similar types of dynamics to what had happened in previous years pre-COVID. But the the Liberon of 2023 was extremely soft. It was actually very, you know, a lot of products that used to sell a lot didn't sell. People who used to go to their communities, their homes to uh, spend time with family chose to travel instead because the 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 borders open and people could go abroad. So it was a very interesting time where I couldn't look backwards to take inspiration for the future. And nobody had insights on where things were going to land. Uh, and especially as a foreign founder who has even you know less uh, insights uh, because I haven't spent a lifetime here, that was quite challenging. So I had to surround myself with really, really solid advisors and people who could open the right doors and guide me. Um, uh, folks like the, um, uh, uh, an individual called Shafi, who was the CEO of Transmart here in Indonesia, and a few other angels that really supported our journey. I don't think we would have been able to get the traction we did and be have the right footing without them supporting us. Indonesia also has seen a, um, the creation of a rise of a number of startup uh, focusing on supply chain uh, logistics. Uh, you know, what is the current landscape today? You know, uh, in 2023 and as market, as you mentioned, is changing. Founding is getting harder. Uh, companies need to show real profits. So what is the landscape of those chain tech company looks like in, in Indonesia? Yeah. I think it's interestingly enough, like I said, the fundamentals for the country are perfect. Where the GDP per capita is at that 5,000 per capita, uh, all the demographics, the, all those fundamentals are still intact. They're beautiful. However, the, what has happened in the past year or so with all the overinvestments, with some startups going under and not being able to, you know, lots of layoffs, that has a little bit tarnished both the investment side of things, but also the market side of things. So on the investment side of things, uh, you know, very openly, I will say that supply chain uh, slash FMCG are not the most uh, sexy and uh, fashionable startups for the time being, just because there is a history of, of there is no history of great outcomes there. So I think that this is going to stay for a while, uh, meaning that not funding will go to other sectors that are more exciting, like environment, ESG stuff, AI, and whatnot. Mm. 
for me, that's great because, you know, it means less people entering, but it also does create a, a barrier for folks who want to innovate in the space and raise substantial capital. From a market perspective, it's also complicated a little bit. People that have seen these startups go under, uh, they are more reluctant to work at startups now. So talent is very difficult. Uh, so once you do have talent, you have to fight a lot to keep them. Um, and you also have to fight to build the right image with potential partners, uh, brand owners, distributors. Sometimes they're reluctant now to engage because they say, hey, are you going to be around next year? Right. So you have to be extremely good at projecting stability, at being professional. And it forces young startups like ours to be professional and to be very you know, engaging in a way that they, they can relate to earlier than probably we would have had to if this wasn't happening in the market. What is your biggest challenge as a CEO and founder of a company right now? My biggest challenge right now um, is people. It's always people. It's back to the point that I was mentioning. Um, you see, our leadership team is very strong, uh, very, very strong. But I know that what ends up being the success of the company is not just the leadership. We can have the best brains and the best direction, but there's the layers below um, are extremely difficult to consolidate in a way that uh, that is conducive, right? Um, so my challenge today is that all of us need to be going into the the detail too often, and uh, sometimes it takes away our ability to be thinking a year, two, three down the line. So you need to be very hands on and sometimes get involved in decisions that's supposed to be uh, taken care of, but you need to step in and, and manage them, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. So is recruiting talents very difficult, especially in the field of uh, tech and supply chain in, in, in a place like Indonesia? I think so. I think uh, vertical software, uh, cloud-based software, uh, there's already a limited pool. Because there's not a history of, uh, there's a history of uh, successful SaaS companies at scale here. Um, so a lot of people go abroad for that. They go to India, they go to develop markets. So finding the talent pool here is already limited. Uh, and then that's even more limited because of the space that we're in. Uh, people don't usually have the experience. They're not companies that have done it. SaaS and in our space. So again, you know, it's a, it's a handful of people that you end up having to, to pick. So definitely I would say so. Um, the second thing again is, is all, uh, kind of timing. Uh, I think people are just a little bit more averse to uh, working at startups at this point in time. So that, that does limit the pool even further. How do you see your company or solution in three to five years from now? I've always dreamt of having basket become the data infrastructure for Indonesia supply chains. Um, I want to be as so plugged in and so many wholesalers across the country that nobody else has the ability to provide data visibility and influence on the flows of goods, both from the upstream to wholesalers and from wholesalers to, to retail. So I guess you can call us, we want to be like a, like a, a super Nielsen for the general trade. Let's put it that way. And after Indonesia, you're looking at other countries in Asia? I would like to. I have a very big uh, dream for Vietnam as well. I think Vietnam is fantastic as a country. Uh, if fundamentally very similar, uh, a little bit easier to manage just because the fragmentation is not as, as acute. Uh, and perhaps Vietnam is one or two years behind Indonesia on some of these digital ecosystem uh, maturity. So yeah, I, I would love to do it there. I've worked in Vietnam as well. Uh, other markets excite me, but uh, in our business model, I'm a big believer that you must verticalize market by market. And the only way to parachute cross market is if you have a consortium of principles that buy into you and say, I'm going to be taking you to other markets and I'll be your anchor. But we're we're not there quite yet. Okay. What would be the advice, <clears throat> the advice to, a, to a new founder who's looking to start a company? So have a company in Indonesia or or a company, you know, focusing on supply chain uh, tech solution, what would be your big advice to them? My advice here would be, it's okay to be contrarian. Uh, I think a lot of people are afraid of their original insight because their original insight goes against what VCs might like or what the market has seen before. There's not a company that has done it in the U.S. or in a different market. So they're kind of flying in, in the dark, right? They are flying blind. Um, and I think that once you have that, you have to really go deep into it and think, hey, is it this way because I'm really onto something? 
and I just need to push myself a little bit further and explore it a little bit more. Um, I find that a lot of founders get uh, discouraged during that journey and they drop ideas that could have been amazing. So I would encourage people to be a little bit more daring and exhaust the idea down to the end, even if it's not a popular one at the beginning. And Indonesia, is it a right market for any entrepreneur to start? And, and it doesn't have to be in supply chain. I mean, in general, is, is this a right market, you know, especially as a foreigner, what's your, what's your view on this? Yeah. I found it to be extremely easy to be welcomed here. The ecosystem is very welcoming. The support structures from the government and from other institutions, the ecosystem is very uh, developed there. So for me to start here, for me to obtain capital with the bridge to Singapore, um, for us to have, you know, advice, mentors, the language aspect of it, I think that facilitated a lot. It definitely will be easier than in certain countries where it might be more restrictive licenses and whatnot. So I'm a big fan of starting a company here and we need more founders. I think the more founders in Indonesia, the better the ecosystem. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jan. I just have a, a few more quick questions for you. And you can just uh, give me a quick answer. Uh, uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Window or aisle? Window. Um, favorite movie or movie you've seen recently that you're really excited about? <laughs> City of God made me really proud of being Brazilian. Okay. All right. What is your favorite lunch? Nasi goreng. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> What's the most used app on your phone right now? The basket app. Okay, after basket. <laughs> <laughs> WhatsApp, we, we love WhatsApp. Where WhatsApp, I'm... okay. What's your favorite tool to build your company right now? I'm a big fan of Jira even as leadership. Jira, uh, yeah, okay. Interesting, which is a project management tool, right? Correct. I use it even for leadership to keep everybody organized. It's it's really solid. Okay. How do you see the rest of your life in, in just a few words, you know, after, you know, when you're much older and you've retired and sold uh, your company at uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and what do you see yourself doing? You know, it's very concerning because the more I progress and learn, the more I want to go deep into things. So I'm kind of concerned. And my wife is also very concerned that, you know, there's no end to it. You know, <laughs> yes. I'll be like Charlie Munger or, or, you know, one of those guys, right. That is always, always plugged in. So I, I think that's how it's going to be for me. I, I, I really enjoy learning new things. So no, you know, chill out on the beach in Indonesia with a, a beer in hand and just, you know, looking at the sunset, right. Probably yeah, not. But, but I'll also yeah. be on the phone and, you know, talking <laughs> to <laughs> And checking your emails. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jan. It was great yeah. having you. Great interview. Very interesting to learn more about basket and what you guys are doing uh, in uh, Indonesia with all those world sellers and distributors. I think it's a great concept. When I wish you all the best uh, in your business and, uh, and your expansion in this market. Thank you so much, Max. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again at uh, next time on Shantech. Thank you.